Every other summer, our parents would pack us up in the car and we'd drive four days across the country to spend a few weeks with my grandmother on her place in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. In our station wagon, there were multiple smokers in the front seat and the windows were generally up. In the back seat, the six Shafroth children were ch exchanging sharp elbows and awaiting the moment at the end of the day after 10 hours on the road when we could wreak havoc on the motel swimming pool. When we finally arrived in Cape Cod, the first thing I did was to put on a ratty old pair of sneakers, run down to the shore of East Bay, and begin to glide my feet along the muddy bottom in search of clams. It would take about an hour to dig a bucket of clams, and I would distribute them accordingly. My mother got the big ones called quahogs for making chowder. My dad liked the little ones called little necks for eating raw. And my sister Tracy and I would take whatever was left over and put them in the back of a little black wagon with a rattly back wheel and sell them to neighbors for 25 cents a dozen. Now, clam digging was in one of the earliest, most memorable outdoor experiences I had, but it wasn't until years later, as a graduate of UCSB, that I really began to forge a deeper connection with the outdoors. That's when I discovered Point Reyes National Seashore. In 1981, I was 23 years old, I spent 48 out of 52 weekends in this place exploring the beaches and headlands just an hour north of San Francisco. Hiking, biking, kayaking, fishing, gathering berries and wild mushrooms, and yes, digging for clams. Only this time the Pacific Coast variety. I couldn't wait for the weekend. It was also a time of my life when I began to separate from my childhood a thousand miles away and to start to become more of my own person. I spent that year with my college sweetheart from Santa Barbara, Sharon, and I learned a little bit about love as well. Alas, that romance didn't last, but my romance with Point Reyes has never faded. It became a favorite place for getaway weekends with friends and a bit of a rite of passage for women I dated at the time. <laughs> my friend Charlie Fager used to tease me, Will, did she pass the Point Reyes test? Eventually, it was where I proposed to my wife at sunset on a cold day in November, seals watching as I awkwardly posed the question. As we raised our kids, it became the favorite week-long vacation spot. Our children opened up on the long hikes to the tall Douglas fir groves, built enormous sandcastles on the beach, and learned how to body surf as the pelicans flew by in formation. Point Reyes is the place that we really connected as a family. What makes you happy? What makes me happy is national parks. It's a place where I can be in nature. It's about family. It's about personal exploration and discovery. What I'm going to do today is to share with you some things that I've learned and that you may not know about our national parks. And the first thing is, in our national parks, you can discover nature as wild as you want it, up close and personal. Fifty national park sites have designated wilderness areas in them. That's the highest level of protection afforded to public lands. It means that things like timber harvesting and grazing and oil and gas extraction and mining and motorized recreation are not allowed in these places. The priority is conservation. 80% of the 84 million acres in our national park system are managed as wilderness. The place that I go to get off the grid, to recharge and reconnect, to be in the wilderness, is Voyageurs National Park. Anybody been there? Heard of it? It's an amazing place. I make a week-long pilgrimage every year with my best friend from Santa Barbara, Jeff Risberg, to explore this place. Uh, and it turns out it's actually a really, really good idea if you're going to go camping with some guy for a week, you're going to be in this tent together, you're going to eat every meal together, you're going to hear them snore, that you start out with a really solid friendship. <laughs> it also takes a long time to get to the wilderness. Jeff and I leave his home in St. Paul, Minnesota, drive five hours to Lake Cabotogama. We take a ride across the lake for seven miles. We put on our 60-pound packs and walk three miles across the locator trail put our stuff in the canoe, and paddle 12 miles to our campsite. Sounds like a lot of fun, right? <laughs> it's actually when we are gliding and paddling across Locator and War Club and Quill Lakes that the layers of stress and bombardment of technology give way to the silence 
the sweet smells, and the stunning beauty of the wild. Okay, there's also the ritual of cracking open a fine Minnesota craft beer when we get to our campsite. That's pretty special too. Our view is of open water, red pine, white pine, cedars. We're surrounded by wildlife, loons and bald eagles, otters, beavers, moose, coyote, wolves, and largemouth bass. Your senses are awakened in this beautiful place. Imagine the daily call of the loons, a, a cool breeze, the big blue sky reflecting on the water. The Foresters National Park draws me in like few places I've ever been. There's also something important when you're in the wilderness that you're stepping away from all of our modern convenience and technology. I become more awake, more resourceful, I feel connected to something bigger than myself. Voyager's National Park really feeds my soul. And this is the second thing I want to share with you about our national parks. They're not just about wild and scenic places. They also tell the important story of who we are as a nation in all its glory and imperfections. They're not just parks, but they're also national monuments, national battlefields, and national historic sites. A few years back, I was working for Ken Salazar, the Secretary of the Interior, and I accompanied him on a trip to Arkansas when we visited Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site. I'd only just learned about the historic importance of this place as the first test case in the, in the post-Brown Board of Education world around the desegregation of our public schools. But what I really hadn't understood much about was the role that the Little Rock Nine had played the nine black students who wanted to go to Little Rock Central High School and all that they endured and the intensity of what they endured. We were joined that day by Minnie Jean Brown, one of the Little Rock Nine, who on September 25, 1957, under the watchful eye of 1,200 armed soldiers, braved an angry mob of protesters in order to try to go to the school there. That day with Secretary Salazar, Minnie Jean walked us down the long sidewalk on the same path that she did, recounting moment by moment what she and her fellow students had gone through, people screaming at her, trying to deny her the ability to go to a school that she was entitled to go to. I got goosebumps. As a relatively privileged white kid from suburban Denver, I had always taken for granted that the public schools that I attended and would attend would always be available for me. No questions. On that day in 1957 when Minnie Jean walked, I was only three months old, but in, 19, in 2011 when we walked together, I felt deep gratitude for her and her fellow classmates for what they did and what, how, what they braved in order for our society to take an important step towards equality. And that's the third thing that I want to talk about in terms of our natural parks. The concept of equality for all citizens is central to the idea of national parks. Full disclosure, my great-grandfather, former congressman, the handsome gentleman on your right with a really bushy mustache, he worked with President Roosevelt and others to craft something called the Antiquities Act. The Antiquities Act gives the president the authority to set aside lands for their natural and cultural significance. Places like California's Muir Woods, Arizona's Grand Canyon, and New Mexico's Chaco Canyon. I didn't ever know my great-grandfather, but his legacy and influence lived on in our family at holiday gatherings when we discussed the issues of the day and the importance of public service. It wasn't until years later when I really studied the foundations of our national parks that I came to realize that these places are really the physical manifestation of our democracy. First, they're there for and belong to all of us. They're part of our birthright as citizens of this country. We all own a piece of Yosemite, the Statue of Liberty, and the Everglades. Second, they tell a really important part of our history and culture, the good, the bad, and the ugly, reminding us how far we have come as a society and how much further we have to go. And finally, they're a place where we come together, they're our common ground. And whether you connect to these places through digging clams or hiking a trail or being inspired by history or just taking in a beautiful vista, we arrive at our common ground through whatever moves us. 
My job at the National Park Foundation now is to inspire people to connect with and protect these national parks, to build support so that our children and our grandchildren and their grandchildren can have the same opportunities that we've enjoyed to appreciate our national parks. A few weeks ago, I was back in Point Reyes, this time hiking the Tamales Bay Trail, surrounded by beautiful fields of purple lupin and yellow buttercup with the Pacific Ocean on one side and Tamales Bay on the other. But the thing that I remember most about that day were the groups of people we encountered. The first one I remember is, was a group of millennials. They were speaking different languages from all over the world, I could tell, uh, taking a lot of selfies and uh, enjoying them themselves immensely. Another one is a, what appeared to be a family of a dozen or 15 people spread out on the trail, single file, engaged in conversation. The lead person was a five-year-old and the person at the end was a 75-year-old. The look on their faces, I have to say it was happy. The Declaration of Independence and the words in it still ring true today. True today. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I maintain that experiencing our national parks is a great way to pursue happiness.